to your hands through your body. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to the Lord and praise Him right now together. Thank you, Jesus. God, we praise you this morning, Lord. Lord, every chance we have, we're going to give you praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you will bless this service today. Bless this Sunday school, Lord. Anoint our teachers. Hallelujah. Touch the music. Anoint this service. Feel somebody with the Holy Ghost today, Lord. I ask you, God, to bless this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Clap your hands to the Lord today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you today, Lord. Welcome to our service today. Now, we had such great two services last night and Friday night. Great crowd of, of children, I think. Someone said total, count the adults that was here with them. We had like 59 last night and, and 58 the night before or vice versa. But that's an awesome crowd of just children just coming to worship the Lord. Some of them are here today. That was that big, uh, 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 the children's crusade. They came back today. That's, that's what we want to see. We want to see children get involved. The Lord said, you suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Now, if you want to get like God, just get like a little child. Amen. Welcome today. We're going to sing another chorus of that Sherry if you would in our Sunday school to be this meeting. Lord, every chance we have, we pray for you. Lord. Every chance I have to praise you, Lord, I will. Lord, I will. deserve any of it. He blesses us abundantly. Amen. That's God. Yes, sir. He sure does. The world doesn't know anything about this. Because the world has never experienced what it's like to know and to be motivated according to the, the principles of Jesus Christ. To look at life differently. And that's really what the Christian faith allows us to do. It allows us to look at a certain set of circumstances that we share with the world and that the world shares with us. Being human, we all have certain obstacles that are in our way, certain objectives that we have to meet. In our culture, we are socialized to believe certain things, certain ways, and the culture shares those things with us. But what they don't have that we do have is that we know Jesus, that we know His teachings, that we feel Him in our spirit because He has blessed us with His spirit, because He's promised us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to see the world through His eyes. To allow our hands and our feet to be His hands and His feet. To be motivated differently. And to realize that our circumstances can be different. To have the hope that the world does not have. Because the world does not know the offer of that hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ. My goodness gracious. Today we're going to study about commitment. And we're going to look at the lesson, and we're going to look at it expressly, studying the life of Joshua, looking at his relationships, looking at those times in his life when I am certain that he had the same unanswered questions 
that many of us have here today. Everybody's life is a journey. And we all set out the same way, one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. And along the way, we have to course correct many times because we often get lost, but then we get found again. Life is not perfect, and the Christian life is no different. But what we know is that Jesus Christ died that we might live a life of righteousness. That through His holiness, that through His power, we might obtain salvation. And that when our faith comes to an end, and we see our Savior face to face, and it finally clicks and the reality finally hits us that it's real. And all the doubt has been erased and all the questions have been answered and we see our Savior, then we will know that the, it was worth it all. The Bible says that obedience is greater than sacrifice. Amen. And obedience to the commandments of God are what will give you that life full of promise, that precious life, that life full of opportunity. You can't break the spirit of a devout Christian. You can't tear them down because no matter what comes against them, the horrors of this life and our community, death, pain, whatever the trial might be, they know that their faith is not in this world or any of its opportunity. Their faith is not in something that they themselves have built with their own hands. Their faith is something that has been obtained by Jesus Christ many years ago. And living for Him and through Him and allowing Him to live through us is what will allow us the privilege of being in our reward one day. This life is not our reward. You know that Jesus talks about a rich man. And that rich man had lived his whole life full of all the wealth of his life in that world. Well, when he died, he ended up pain and tormented. Well, he was in hell. And we see from the example that he says, just, just a small drop of water, just please, just offer me just this one little bit of refreshment. And he wouldn't allow them to have that. And then he says, well, at least tell my brothers and, and tell my family that they can avoid this pain and this turmoil that I'm suffering. And then Jesus tells him, and also telling us, that if they won't listen to the prophets, if they won't listen to those that have come before and have given the message, then they're not going to listen even if we tell them personally. And so basically today, we have the law of God. We have the holy writ of Scripture. We have the same opportunity to go out into the world and to teach as the prophets and the apostles and all of those were trying to do. They, in the Old Testament, had an imperfect knowledge of who this Messiah would be. They just kept looking and searching for who He would be. And then He came, burst forth on the scene as Jesus Christ. We see that the angels announced His birth. And we see that as He grew, He became the world's greatest teacher, the world's greatest man of principle, the world's greatest influence on every culture. Now the world cannot believe in Him. They can disrespect His name. They can say that they don't follow Him, but they cannot deny that there has never been a more instrumental figure in the history of the world than Jesus Christ. And so today we have this commitment to make, and that commitment is all wrapped up in a name. And that name is Jesus. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity many years ago to be a person that was taught about Jesus. That was told the life that He lived and the life He offers to those that will just simply believe in Him. That will come and believe beyond the fact of just pure knowledge. Because the world, even though they're lost, they know about a man named Jesus. Most of them, if you say the name Jesus, they remember some story or some example that they've read, maybe in a history book, maybe some professor in some institution has told them something about this man Jesus and it's been from a totally secular position. They know Him, but they don't know Him. They know about Him, but they don't have a relationship with Him. And so we must understand today that Jesus Christ is what will take us out of this pain. He is the one that has came and paid the price and tasted the bitterness that we taste every day. He has seen the experience and pain of loss. He has felt it for Himself. And He came anyway and gave it up. Gave up His own blood, shed His own blood that we too might be saved. Getting into the reading, I just want to read one verse when we begin. The, the title of the lesson today is Committed to the Cause. And if you would, let's go ahead and stand and we'll read this verse together and then we'll have prayer. 
Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9 is what I'd like to read. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. Sister Creasy, would you pray? Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you, Jesus. God, for the privilege, Lord, to be gathered together in thank your name. You, Lord, you said, well, there's two or three in your name, Lord. Thank that you, God, you would be in the midst. And yes. Lord, we thank you, God, that we know. Lord, that you're here with us today. We pray, God, a special anointing upon Brother Mark as he ministers the word of the Lord. We pray a special anointing upon our hearts and upon our ears that we can receive what thus said the word of the Lord. God, be with us today, Lord, and let us leave here today, God, with an expectation, God, Lord, of seeing, Lord, you soon return. Lord, we love you today, and we thank you, God, for your blessed word. Use it today, God, that souls may be saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for being here. Sunday school is vitally important to building that lack, that knowledge, to building that faith. You know that it takes knowledge to build faith. That if you don't know something about someone, then you're not going to have much faith in that someone. And so many times people will mention a relationship with the Lord or they will talk about knowing Jesus. However, they don't do the spiritual disciplines that we've talked about just about every Sunday in order to really have that knowledge base. As a matter of fact, Hosea, I believe it's 4 and 6, I could be wrong, it's in chapter 4, he says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. And if there's one thing that America is losing and has lost, many would argue, is knowledge. Yeah. We do things every day in our land, our children and their children and so many others. They do things because of routine or because they've always done it that way. They don't know their history. Many times, some comedians you'll watch probably in the evening shows, you'll see that they go out on the highways and the byways in these big cities. And they'll, in, they'll uh, intentionally target some young person, someone 30 or below that age, and they'll ask them questions. Questions that everybody that is a red-blooded American ought to know. Like, uh, well, who was George Washington? And they don't know. Who was John Adams? Well, they, they don't know. Abraham Lincoln. Most know him, but if you ask about certain things that he did or certain things that he said, they don't know. If you ask them about Abraham Lincoln, they say he freed the slaves, and that's the extent of their knowledge. That man did so much, and so many of these presidents did so much, driven by their faith, to give us the opportunity to worship freely. We are here today because of our principles studying Jesus Christ, because of our relationship with Him, we are allowed to freely assemble and to be here because of what these men saw. Because of their vision for a land in which men could not come to power to take away from you your relationship with Jesus. That if a tyrant came into power, you had protections inside the Constitution. These visionaries wrote it in a way so that you as your last line of defense could take care of yourself. That if everything else breaks down, we're going to give them a second amendment so that, Lord, I pray that they'll never have to take up arms against a government that has become a tyrannical government. But if they do, let's let them know that through Jesus Christ and in their own power and ability, they can take back the freedom that they've lost. That is what they stood for. They didn't stand for some collective state of people that took from one and gave to the other. They didn't stand for some federal government that lorded over 50 states and that forced and imposed its will upon these states. That wasn't their vision for America. Their vision for you was to allow you an individual freedom. They did not have that under the king. They fled the king because the king would not allow them this liberty that I'm discussing today. They fled because they were forced to be a part of one church and they didn't believe, they didn't have the faith to believe what the king told them that they must believe. So they were persecuted. And through their persecution and their religious persecution, they fled and they came to a new land. They, like Abraham, modeled Abraham when Abraham went out and he walked and he followed a God that he did not know. They knew their God. Abraham didn't. But the way they were like Abraham is that Abraham stepped out in faith and went to a place he did not know. He just stepped out and said, God lead. And God led him. These pilgrims, the founding fathers, they did the same. 
They stepped out in faith and they got on these ships and they went to a land that they did not know because they were committed to Jesus Christ. And if it cost them their family, if it cost them their business, if it cost them their financial stability, if it cost them the protection of the world's most powerful army and navy, they were willing to give up everything that they might know Jesus Christ. They had a zeal and a passion and a commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ that they were willing to put their lives and their families on the line. Now most men today, if he's a man at all, will tell you that I'll die for my family. My family, I love them, I'll die for them. But it takes a real man, a man really truly devoted to the cause of Christ to even put his family at risk. And that's what they did. They would have rather seen themselves and their families taste death and be with Jesus than to watch as their children grow up in a paganistic environment. To not know Jesus. To be surrounded by people who did not know and respect and love their Creator. Death is much more sweet than knowing my children live a hundred years old and they die lost. It's prioritizing. These are hard things. and I understand that. But I want you to realize that commitment is all about priority. And if our priority is wrong, our commitment will be wrong. And if we don't realize that Jesus Christ is chief, first and foremost, what we must be devoted and dedicated to, then we cannot be totally committed to Christ. If we do not look at the examples of Scripture that tell us that our world revolves around Jesus, Every day, everything that we do, when we arise, we should be doing the things that we do or learning the things that we should learn so that we might be pleasing to God. It's not hard to do. And many people will say, well, sometimes it is very difficult to read the Bible. It's difficult to understand it. It's difficult to read our history. It's difficult. I don't understand some things. And you know, when, when we see those kinds of things or I'm given those kinds of examples, I oftentimes tell people that it's just like everything else in life that is worth anything. The glory, the pleasure is in the journey. It's in the life that you live. It's in taking the pieces that you do know about the Scripture or the pieces that you do know about the American colony or about the American history and then you just build on that and you go slow. You take it slow and you pray that God will show you and God will. The problem is we live in a very distracted society today. Because what I mentioned earlier about these people that go out and ask these young people all of these questions about history and about government, they don't know about the executive branch or the legislative branch or the judicial branch. They don't know much about the Declaration of Independence. If you ask them who were some of the signers, they can't tell you. If you ask them about the financial, uh, the reasons for the financial view of history that we have today, they don't know. If you ask them about the Founding Fathers and their faith, most of them have been led to believe that, well, they had faith, but it was just kind of a back, something they didn't really think about, and it really didn't drive them. They're trying to take these very devout people and put them in the same situation that we are today. They're trying to convince us that, well, they may have been Christians on Sunday, but they weren't Christians Monday through Saturday. And as a result, we've seen that as Christianity has not been taught, it hasn't been taught in the homes, it hasn't been taught effectively by the church. We haven't seen uh, the church is not doing very well as far as the church going out into the nation and winning people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm a part of the church. And I love the church of Jesus. And as we said in recent weeks, I want you to know that that's the only thing, that's the only organization, that's the only thing that matters when it comes to your salvation is being a part of God's church. Now, I'm not talking about meeting in a certain building. I'm not talking about doing certain things or working yourself into some form of salvation. But what I'm saying is if you are not a part of the church, if you are not filled with God's Spirit, if you are not led by God and have a relationship with God, it's not that God is sending you away and complete... Uh, uh, sending you away to some place that you don't want to be or He's punishing you in some way. He has given you the free will to choose. And what's beautiful about free will is that you have the opportunity to say no. And if you didn't have the opportunity to say no, then you couldn't make the argument that you had true free will whatsoever. If I program my computer at home to do certain things and do certain tasks every day, that computer does that because I've commanded it to do that and it has no choice. 
It has no free will. It can't think on its own. My computer at home can't tell me no because I've told it what to do and it follows every command. The most beautiful thing, I think, about salvation is the fact that it's not guaranteed that every man has the choice. Now let me say that again. One of the most beautiful things about it is that it's not guaranteed and that every man has the choice. Think about how much God loved us in the fact that though He could have created us to only serve Him, to only be good, to only be led by His Spirit, He chose to allow us to say no, to reject Him, to reject the principles and His teachings, to reject His Holy Spirit. That to me is true love. Now many people say, well how can a good God call Himself good and yet still people die and they die lost? How could that happen? And there's a couple of misunderstandings in that, but I just want to look at one. The commitment to Jesus Christ is not a hard one, but it is required in order that we might be saved. And so we have to understand that there are people that rightfully, right out reject the salvation that saves men. And yet and still, every day they have to seek for some sort of motivation because they look in the mirror and they see what you see. They see that their life is passing by and they're getting older. And they know that the one thing that's common to every man is that they will die. And so, as they search around and look to define themselves, to find something to be committed to, something to live for, many of them never figure that out. I don't think there's any person, no matter how much wealth, no matter how much knowledge, no matter how much power, they've just seen that they have it all figured out. They look good, they speak good, they say the right things, and life just seems to be very good. But I just want you to know, I don't believe there's a man, and I believe the Bible supports this, that doesn't look up every day and say, what if I'm wrong? I say there's no God, but what if I'm wrong? And these people that are lost, knowing that death is what is going to ultimately befall them, what motivates them to continue? What hope do they have? Their reason has failed them. They've believed in science and technology and it has not yet led to eternal life. There are many that have said, well, let's do this and let's invent these new drugs and let's do these. There's pharmaceutical companies spending billions of dollars every year trying to develop cures for various diseases brought about by sin. Right. The whole purpose is let's hold on to this life because my life is so precious. And that's what motivates those that don't know the Lord. What motivates those of us that do know the Lord is the fact that this life is only the beginning. It's the fact that when we go to our graves, we know through our faith and through our experience and our relationship with God that we don't have to fear the grave because the grave is just a stepping stone crossing over that Jordan River so that we might be with our Savior. And because we've had a relationship with Him, we're no longer fearful of that day. Because we want more than anything to see Him. Amen. To experience His love for ourselves. John even told us in the book of John, he said that if we wrote down everything that He did, the world could not even contain the books. I want to be around a Savior that I can admire. One that doesn't, have the, that doesn't fall short the way that so many of the men that I admire on this earth do. Even those that preach the gospel, those that I have put in my life as examples to me and to my family that I try to model myself after, they even make mistakes. And they even have their failures. But one day we're going to be with one that has no mistakes. Amen. That he's made no mistakes. That he's fallen to no temptation. That if there's anyone that I want to model myself after, it's going to be Jesus. Amen. The basis of our faith must be a commitment to the Lord. The same generation that doesn't know who they are, that doesn't know their family history, that doesn't know their Christian history, that doesn't know their American history that the pundits make so much fun of in these shows that we mentioned about. They've got telephones and, and computers and access to all the knowledge that there ever could be. That any man sit down and type in the knowledge is available. All they have to do is type in John Adams or George Washington. 
They need to type in Abraham Lincoln or they type in Jesus Christ and they type in the Christian religion and they type in the pilgrims and the founders and what led them here. They, all that information is available. All you've got to do is look for it. And so the Christian life is not a life of a painful trying every day to figure something out that we don't have the answer to. The Christian life is a journey, but realizing that the journey was made complete many years ago. The that Jesus lived the life and showed us the example. That He told us of the promises. That He told us that we could too live like He lived. Not because we are able, because we're not. Because in our own power we are imperfect. And the least among us, we all have sin. The greatest among us, we all have sin. No man can say that he has no sin because he's lying, the Bible says. Because we all fail. But we know that through the power of Jesus Christ, we are able to mimic His life, to pray each day that we might live the life that He has for us to live. I was called into a meeting this last week. And in this meeting, I sat down with a business leader. And his business has grown. His business is growing by leaps and bounds. He's to a transition period in his business. And he has gotten so large as far as the money coming in and the business coming in and the people that he's servicing, but he doesn't have the talent to continue the success. So he's in a position now where it's just a couple of them that he can truly depend on that have been trained, that have uh, understanding of the business and customer service and are able to train others and, and build their capabilities and to take what he has learned and what he has been able to build and to take that and to impress on the next generation the great object of how to service customers, how to do what we do, how to show them that we are able to do these things, how to be that most profitable but also the friendliest store in town to offer something different that no one else can offer and so he's in a position now of transition where he's older and his, he's got some children but they're not quite ready yet and he's got a partner but he's not quite what he's looking for and he's really needing someone that can carry that business into the future someone that can help him to continue down that path and you know I said in this meeting and I listened to this brother's concern and he is a brother. He's a Christian. And, and we talked, and it ended up talking, we started talking about the Lord. And you know, he said, brother, he said, I'm trying to make all these plans, and I'm trying to do all these things. He said, and many times I just question myself, am I doing the right thing? Should I do this differently? Should I not build this store? Should I build another store? He said, I'm asking all these questions, talking about spending all this money, and talking about people's lives. He employed people, so he was concerned about his employees. He wanted to make good decisions so that they could support their families as well. And he said, you know, at all these plans and all this, and he said, many times I just don't even know what I'm doing or if I'm doing the right thing. And I said, brother, I said, well, I'm going to tell you something, and y'all have heard me say this, but he had never. I said, many times in our culture and our society, we feel like we have to plan 30 years in advance or 40 years down the road right. or 10 years down the road. I said, do you know what the Scripture says? One day at a time right. in Jesus' name. Absolutely. And he looked at me kind of like he'd never seen that. He said, well, you know, he said, I read my Bible every day. He said, and I understand what you're saying. And I was able to use some scriptural examples and I don't have time to do today. But to try to convey that message to him that it's every day having your best day that day and allowing this day to be the day that I will take and to use this day to touch someone for Jesus. Whether it's through my business, whether it's through my employment, or whether it's through something that God allows me to do. Teaching, witnessing, whatever. Amen. Just allowing God to put something in my path and being sensitive enough to God's Spirit to take hold of what He's allowing me to do. That connection He's allowing me to connect to and then allowing God to use me, to work through me. Amen. And he said, you know, brother, he said, I've heard similar things to that. He said, but... You know, sometimes I think, what am I supposed to do? Just wake up and show up? And I said, brother, and, and what it is, is he was trying to do like many of us do. And to realize that it's easy sometimes to read about characters in the Bible, to read about the examples of what they did. And many times in the Old Testament, you would think that many of these people, such as Joshua, which we'll get into in just a moment, that God was just walking right beside them. And they were just having a conversation. And so God said, do this, and He did it, and everything was fine. And then so they, they go on down the road there, and, and then you, you see that, well, God tells them to do something else, the Scripture says. 
We get this vision in our mind that God's just right there beside them. That He's in physical form and He's telling them and directing them to do everything that He tells them to do. You know, the Bible does tell us about many times when He did come and commune with people. And the Bible makes it clear that He was there in a presence or in form. But do you know that most of the time God was not physically there saying do this and do that. They, they were being led by people that were sensitive to God's Spirit and they just stepped out in faith knowing that God had given them a promise, knowing that God had given them a commitment, and knowing that God does not dishonor His commitment. And so from that fact, from the fact and the knowledge that they knew that God was committed to them and they were committed to God, they were willing to go out and to destroy the invading army. They were willing to go out and to build cities in places that they may not have seen deemed safe at that time. They stepped out in faith believing that the commitment that God had made to them was good enough that they were willing to take God at His Word, knowing that God's Word was powerful and that God's Word was able to do whatever they thought they needed to have done. That if God was in it, it would be successful. And so I think that was probably what was in this man's mind as he said that, you know, what am I supposed to do? Just show up? I believe we all make plans. And we have to. Organizations die without plans. If a business doesn't have a plan and there's no successor and there's no training, that organization, it doesn't matter how many millions they're making today, they will be out of business within a decade. They don't have talent. They don't have people. They don't have the human element. They haven't built a successor. Churches are no different. If a church has no plan for the future, if a church has no plan for what comes in the future as far as leadership, as far as the ministries that it grasps hold of, if a church doesn't have a successor, if a church doesn't take the same approach as an organization, as a business does, and train and develop and disciple and build capacities, then that church is going to die. It's as simple as that. And we've seen some good men in great churches that have, because of whatever reason, not been able to put a secession plan in place, not be able to put someone in leadership or to disciple people that could take that church building or that church, that church in that community to the next level. And as a result, those churches are closed or they're in turmoil today. And so I think it's important that we understand that there are a few things we're going to learn through this lesson with Moses in Joshua. And that first off, it's a commitment to God. And that commitment, meaning that you've heard from God, or you feel that God is doing this work in your life. Someone has come to you and said, hey, God is doing this work in your life. And then you've acknowledged that, and you've accepted that, meaning you've prayed, God, I accept this commitment. I accept what you have planned for me. I accept what you have given me to do, this task, this work, this burden, whatever you want to call it. And from that day forward, walking toward that commitment. Realizing that you're not going to always feel like God's right here beside you directing every footstep. God didn't do that in the Old Testament. He didn't do that in the New Testament. They were driven by God's Spirit. We have something that they didn't have in the Old Testament, and that is that the Spirit of God is alive inside of the heart of a Christian. And so we make decisions and we step out and we go out in faith and we allow God to direct our footsteps. But how that happens is we go, we pray, we do the spiritual disciplines, read our Bible, have knowledge of the Lord, build a relationship with Him, do the best we can to model our life after His teachings and the life that He lived, and then we just go a day at a time. And we ask the Lord to direct us. That applies to every area of life. We make plans. And then if those plans change or if those plans seem to impede in our relationship with God, then we course correct. We change our plans and we go a different direction. It's a journey. We talked in recent weeks about the fact that so many believe that you're saved at one time early on in life and that God will never reject His kids and that you can never reject God again and all of those things. And then as a result, they find no reason to read the Word of God. They find no reason to build a relationship with God. They find no reason to study about Him, to pray to Him. Because they just believe that, well, I've done what this man told me I was supposed to do. I read what I was supposed to read. No one else told me I had to do anything differently. And as a result, many of them don't know the Lord. Don't know the Lord. 
The Bible says in Matthew 7, do you know Jesus said that many will say to me in that day, meaning that last day, that Lord, Lord, did we not do miracles? He's talking about them doing miracles. Operating the gifts of the Spirit in His name. And He says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. They weren't doing what they were doing, though they were using God's Spirit to do it. They were doing it for some ulterior reason, not because of devotion to God or devotion to God's people. Many will call on my name. The Bible says that the demons believe there's one God they trust. The Bible says that they know about Jesus. The demons do. Yet even though they know Him, remember when, uh, and I don't pronounce the word correctly, I'm sure, but the sons of Siva, Skeva, S-C-E-V-A, those of you may can help me. But it talks about how that the disciples had gone out and tried to cast out them. These people that were not disciples, but they had gone out and tried to do these things. And the devil spoke to them directly and said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? And so they didn't have the authority. They didn't have the power to exercise those gifts. But what is important to realize is that the demon himself said, Jesus we know. And so if all it takes is knowing Jesus, is just knowing about Him, then why aren't the demons saved? If it's just believing in Him, when James tells us that the demons believe and tremble, why are they not saved? If it's not a little bit different than that, if there's not something else to it, then why can we get up here and preach these things? Well, we can. The New Testament plan of salvation is Acts 2.38. And I want you to know that any church that tells you differently has a misunderstanding of the Scripture. You can take and contextualize the grievous of sin and error by taking the Bible out of context. If you look in the Roman, the book of Romans, there are writings in chapter 10 that would lead you to believe that all it takes is just calling on the name of the Lord one time and you're saved. The problem is, is the book of Romans was written to a church. A church full of people that had already experienced the New Testament plan of salvation. And so Paul is not talking about converting this church. They've already been converted. He's trying to answer problems and answer questions that they have written to him about. And so he's writing this letter telling them how they can continue to be saved. The problem is, is that if you believe that once saved, always saved, then you don't believe there's ever a need for a Christian to come back and repent. You don't believe there's ever a need for a Christian to come back and to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And so what you see in most churches is that error begets error. One error leads to another error. And a greater error. And before you know it, you've taken the Bible out of context. You cannot find a plan of salvation outside of the book of Acts. Praise the Lord. All the other letters were written to churches already in existence. Praise God. We must understand that we have no fear in Jesus Christ. All men fear. All men have natural emotions. All men doubt. All men, even those that I mentioned earlier that seem to have it all figured out, they have their doubts. They look in the mirror in their times of vulnerability and they say, I don't know what I'm going to do today. I don't know how I'm going to continue doing this that I'm doing. I don't know how my life has become such a charade. I don't know how to continue to go in front of all of these people that think I have done something so grand and I know that I've done nothing because I haven't solved the ultimate problem. What am I going to do when this is over? Death being the greatest of motivations. We see in the times of Moses and Joshua that there had been four years of bitter slavery. 400 years. And these, the Israelites had been enslaved. And we see that God allows Moses to come on the scene. Calls him. Even as a baby for a divine purpose. He had heard the cryings of his people, his children. And though he had allowed them for so many years to live in slavery, he was ready to pull them out of slavery because he heard their cries. He heard their pleas. And so we see Moses come on the scene and allow them the opportunity to be saved. We see all the miracles, the curses and the plagues that God put upon Egypt, and yet He spared all the Israelites during this entire time. And we see them come out after seeing this grand display of God's power. Then we see that not soon thereafter the Red Sea experience happens. And they walk across on dry ground seeing the miraculous, the miracles of God on display in front of their very lives. 
And yet and still we see very soon after that they're discouraged because they don't have the food that they prefer to eat. They're starving. Or they, for whatever reason, murmur against God. They're angry with Him. Because though they've seen miracles, and though they might not outright charge God, their faith was waning. It was done. Think about yourself. Now, I've never been in a hundred years of slavery. I've never seen God take the sea and roll it back and me walk across on dry ground. These folks had seen that. And yet and still, their faith failed them. Yet and still, they had to go back and ask God for repentance. Yet and still, the mighty and the miraculous that they had seen on display had left their memory in such a short time. And you see the Israelites throughout the Old Testament, it just seems like they, they would figure it out. They would get back to God and realize He was the source of their power. He was the source of their strength. He was the source of everything good in their life. And then they would just go the opposite direction. In times of plenty, in times when God had blessed, in times of prosperity, it was just so easy to forget about God. They didn't need Him anymore. He had taken care of their needs and now it became about them. What have I done? What am I doing now so that I might prolong this prosperity? And well, then they would forget about God and then they would lose everything that they had built. In Numbers 13, 1 through 2, God commanded Moses to send 12 spies into the land of Canaan, declaring that He was giving that land to the children of Israel. This is next on the timetable. The promised land was amazing. The Bible describes it. Grapes, pomegranates, milk, and honey. Despite all that the land had to offer, all of its beauty that they came back and, and reported, ten of the spies said, we can't take the land. Their people are giants. We can't. We're, fe we're fearful. We're discouraged. We can't do it. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, oh no, we can do it. God made us a promise. God made us a commitment. We don't know how we're going to do it, but we know we can do it because God made us the promise. And well, we see that God gets very angry at the Israelites about this time in their life because though they had seen the miracles, though they had seen the Red Sea experience, though they had been provided by the very hand of God for their sustenance, they chose not to honor God and be obedient to Him. They feared the people and the opinion of the ten spies was so powerful and so numerous and so overwhelming that these men, though they focused only on circumstances rather than focusing on the power of God, they fought a fight they said they could not win. And the people believed them. Nothing kills enthusiasm and faith like a negative attitude. The lesson writer says that, and I believe that wholeheartedly. Joshua stood boldly, and he repudiated everything that had been said. He tells us in Numbers 14, 8 and 9, If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That was Joshua doing his speech. He was giving his testimony. I have seen what these other ten have seen. I know the obstacles. I know the barriers. But I believe that God will make us victorious. His faith being in God. Well, he was rewarded by that. They wanted to stone him to death. They wanted to kill him. He didn't have the popular opinion. And many times the church today doesn't have the popular opinion. You've heard from God. You know what God's Word says. You know what the commitment requires in, is required in the Bible. You've made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ yourself. However, it's not positive. And the world wants to stone you to death. They don't want to hear about spiritual solutions to America's problem. They don't want to hear about a philosophy about Jesus Christ when we talk about whatever we talk about in American leadership today. They look at money, politics, power, education. Those are the gods in America today. That's right. Praise the Lord. The response of the congregation, they wanted him dead, and God was so displeased with their response to Joshua. Think about this. They had heard this response from ten negative people. And then Joshua stands up with a word from the Lord, and they want to kill the man that's got the word from the Lord. That's right. So Joshua, or excuse me, the Lord gets so angry at their response to Joshua, that this is one of the times when he tells Moses, he says, I'm going to destroy them all. That's right. And I'll just raise up a nation from you, Moses. 
And then Moses petitions God. He says, Lord, don't do this thing. If you do it, then do it to me too. Kill me too. Right. He said, you don't want to know that you don't want people to think that you led your people out into the wilderness only to destroy them. You don't want to be that kind of God. And so he questions God, but he doesn't do it in an irreverent or a, a, a way that brings disrespect to God. He just basically reminds God of the promise that he made to Abraham. Remember God, I know you're angry, but remember you made a covenant with Abraham. And these are Abraham's people. And I love these people, and these are your people. And so don't destroy this people. And the Bible says that God changes His mind, and He doesn't. And we see that. The people of Israel, they were compelled by God because though He doesn't destroy them, He punishes them. And how He punishes them, not because He's angry to the point of wanting to pour out His wrath upon them, but because they have no faith to believe in the power of God. They have no faith to believe what God has promised them, and they're not committed to the Lord. So what He does is allows them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. He, the generation that doubted, the generation that sought to stone Joshua, the generation that came against God in that time in their life, they were all to die in the wilderness. That was the sentence. And what they did in the next generation ultimately was the one that followed Joshua into the promised land. That's right. But I want to call your attention to Joshua for just a moment because though Joshua had it figured out, Though Joshua knew the word from the Lord, though Joshua was committed to the Lord, he had to wander for 40 years in the wilderness too. That's right. He didn't enjoy it, I'm sure. I'm sure he told himself, him and Caleb both, they probably said, we could be in the land that God had promised us right now. I'm sure they had grand visions and ideas. That thought, remember, they had been there. They had seen all of the abundance right. that was there. Right. They had seen it with their own eyes. They had experienced God's provision and then only to have it snatched away from them because they saw people and belonged to a community of believers that had no faith. That's right. Their promise was delayed simply because the people that they were a part of, because their country, because their nation, because their community would not embrace the faith, would not embrace the commitment that was required to honor God, they too had to wander for 40 years. That's right. And we never read. When, when, when we come back around to the fact that those two were spared, the rest of them had died. These two were 40 years older. But when we get back around to that position, we see that they don't come and angrily get upset with God. We don't see them charge God and say, well, we believe. How come we didn't get to go ahead to the promised land? They realized that they were a part of that nation and a part of that community. Why would Moses say, God, don't destroy these people or destroy me with them? Even though he was angry with them at the time. Right. Even though they had disobeyed him and by turn disobeying God. That's right. Because he loved them. Because he was unwilling to see them perish though he knew they were disobedient. Why didn't he just say, well God, just raise up a generation for me. That'll be fine. The God of Moses. And you know, we can just have that instead of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's have the God of Moses and you know, just go on down the line here and we'll just bring, raise up the Messiah through the lineage of Moses. Why didn't Moses say that? Seemed like an excellent opportunity to take the opportunity to get a little fame for himself. To build a name even greater than he had for himself. The reason he didn't do that is because he loved those people. And he realized that God loved those people. And it all went back to the original commitment that Moses had made to God. God came to Moses and called him out to deliver those people. And if it meant delivering those people from the wrath of God, he was even willing to deliver them from the wrath of God because his commitment was to deliver God's people. Not to build a name for himself, not to build a family dynasty, but to deliver God's people, even from the wrath of God. So I believe if Joshua and Caleb had been given the opportunity, if God said, fine, you believe they don't, we'll destroy them, you go into the land, I don't believe they would have. They had seen Moses. They had followed in his footsteps. They had seen all the sacrifice he was willing to make for this disobedient people. I believe they would have said, Lord, we'll just stay with them. And when you decide to allow them to go, we'll go with them. I believe that would have been in their heart. We don't see that. That wasn't given. The Bible doesn't say that ever happened. But I believe following the example of Moses, they would have made that decision. Praise the Lord. The people in the nation were driven by fear, not by promises, not by commitment. 
They were driven by tangible things. Things that they could see right in front of them. They knew God. They had seen the miracles of God, but it had been some time since they had seen those miracles, I'm sure. But now they see these great men, these powerful men, this object that is just going to destroy them. They don't have the ability in their own ability to go out and fight these people. To take back from these people what God had said was theirs all along. They, they, they didn't have the ability to do that. That's the reason I think why we talk about David and Goliath so much. Because all of these warriors were sitting out here going, oh my gosh, we can't fight this guy. This guy's too big. He's going to destroy us. He's going to kill you. He's going to kill you. That, that's what they're thinking. They're thinking about their own ability. And then there comes this little puny boy along and says, who is this? Who is this? Talking about you that way. Who is that disregarding our God that way? Who is that disregarding our nation that way? Let me fight him. I'll fight him. It was that faith. It was that opportunity in which he believed in God because he knew God. Because he was out in the pasture playing on the harp and singing to God up in the heavens when his brothers were home enjoying the benefits of being at home. He was the castaway. He was the child that daddy didn't like, that daddy never wanted. They threw him to the side and he's out shepherding sheep. And from a very young age, he knows if I don't have Jesus, I have nothing. If I don't have God, I don't have nothing. He is who I am. He is able to do these things for me. Bring the bear. Bring the lion. Bring all of this danger my way. And I know because I've been with Him that He will not allow me to be defeated. That faith. And so he goes on that battlefield with that same faith, believing that, and he even says it. The Bible records that he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And as soon as that happens, that faith, that statement of faith, that belief of faith, that heart of faith, allow him to slay a giant that the warriors in the land were too afraid to fight. We see that same spirit throughout the Bible. You see people that get so intrinsically involved with the tangible things in life, the things that they're building for themselves. I have certain things I have to do every day. I have certain places I have to be every day. I have certain things that, are, that I'm responsible for. Me too. But ultimately, it's realizing that that is not our priority. My priority is not to be the best this, this, and this if I'm not first the best child of God, the first best Christian, if I'm not first the best servant of the Most High God, if my faith is not in Him and not in these other things. It must be in the Lord. Amen. I'm not telling you to do like they did in Thessalonica. Do you know that Paul had to write them a letter and say, you can't not work waiting on the coming of the Lord. Basically, they're sitting around waiting on the second coming. He says, we got to get to work until the Lord comes back. It's in your Bible. He says, get up! Do something! And you notice that any time the Lord gives a command or a promise, there's work involved. There's a battle to fight. There's the Amalekites to slay. There's Philistines to slay. There's something that has to be done. God is not going to open up the heavens and pour out your next meal. He's not going to open up the heavens and pour out that next prescription. He's not going to open it. He's going to use people like you to bless people like that. You are His hands. You are His feet. You are the supernatural element of God. You have His Spirit inside of you. Change the world. It's as simple as that. Change the world. Today we face giants all around us in leadership, in public policy. We see all kinds of things that are disobeying and disavowing God in our own land. A land built by Christian people for Christian people. We've gotten too comfortable. We've gotten too prosperous. We've forgotten what it means to suffer the gospel. Do you know that in the fires of persecution is when the church always grew to its That's greatest right. capacity? Amen. Because they had nowhere else to look but God. Amen. And do you know that Jesus told us when He's talking about the little children, He said, unless you become like one of them, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Do you know what He means by that? He means that that little child depends on you for everything. Food, water, shelter, clothing, whatever. It, your child is totally dependent on you. If you don't believe that, take your child, put him out in the wilderness for a year and go back and find him. And I promise you, he will not have made it. Your child is totally dependent on you. So what Jesus is saying is, you must be totally dependent on God, your Father in Heaven. Be totally dependent on Him. He 
He knows you have needs. He knows you have wants. He knows you have desires. He will give you what you need. And building from that perspective, Lord, I don't know. Yesterday was a bad day, God. And today's not looking much better. But I know who you are. I know your plan for my life. I know your calling on my life. And I'm just going to keep doing what I know to do because I don't know what else to do. And it's in those times of desperation when you have nowhere else to look but up and you say, God, I don't know why my children are not doing right. Why my family's not doing right. Why this brother did this to me. Why this sister did this to me. Why the job is failing. Lord, I don't know why. But God, I know you have a purpose for all of this and I'm just going to keep doing what I know is right. Praise God. Praise God. Following Moses' death, God commissioned Joshua. He passed the mantle to Joshua, that one that had shown such tremendous faith. And Joshua would be the one that would lead that nation into the next generation. And we see that Joshua is fully committed to the Lord. And he's fully committed to what he believes that original commitment to have been. This is not hard. Living is hard. And life is difficult. But it is not hard to realize what I'm trying to express this morning. It's making a commitment Amen. one day yes, in sir. your life yes, sir. and never abandoning that commitment. Amen. It's as simple as that. It's God, I believe you're able to heal and I believe you're able to do the supernatural, but if you never do another miracle in my life, I'm going to follow you anyway because I made a commitment on that day that I was going to follow you, that I was going to model my life after you, that I was going to honor you every day of my life, that I wasn't going to march to my, march to my own beat, but I was going to march to your beat. I was going to tell the world about you. And God, I haven't had a miracle in a while. I pray for sister and brother. That church hasn't grown down the street at all. But Lord, I'm going to follow you because I made a commitment to follow you many years ago. That's what it takes. Praise the Lord. It's taking today. Maybe you've never done this. When we have altar service, you just come down here today and you pray, God, I commit my life to you. I pray, God, you take control, that you take everything that I am, everything that I hope to be, and you use it for your glory. And from this day, July 31st, 2016, I'm going to march after you. I'm going to do what you command me to do. And when I don't know the answer to the question, I'm just going to seek it out through the Word of God and I'm going to do the best I can. And God, if you'll honor that, then I will never ever abandon my commitment to you. You just get down here today and you say something similar to God and I promise you your life will be fulfilling. Praise the Lord. God commanded Joshua three times. He used this word. Be courageous. Courage. Be courageous. He knew. God knew that Joshua was getting ready to go into some very uncertain circumstances. Into some very uncertain lands. God had given them this land, but the people that owned it right now didn't know that. Right. So they weren't going to give it up easily. They're going into another man's house. And they're getting ready to take what God had given to them. You think that was easy? Would that make you fearful? I know it would make me fearful too. But God reminded him, He said, be courageous. Three times, be courageous. Be courageous. Joshua, I've given you the promise. It's going to be yours. I'll fight the battles with you. But you're going to have to fight the battle. And so we go. Joshua 1, 7 and 8 says, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from the right hand or to the left, and thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. You will be successful. You will be prosperous if you commit your life and you commit your heart Amen. to the Lord. Amen. Joshua's commitment was an excellent example to the people of Israel. Because we see as they go and they fight battle after battle and they take land from these that God had promised they could have from these others that were previously owning this land. Battle after battle. Victory after victory. They saw the hand of God work in ways that they had never thought possible. They seen the miracles, but they were involved in the battle just as well. They saw as they fought that God performed a miracle each and every time. 
They saw Joshua's stance Praise before God. the Lord. They saw his commitment to God. They saw him unwavering in his support and his commitment to the Most High. Amen. Joshua 24 and 24 says, And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God, we will serve, and his voice we will obey. We will obey. And then Joshua 24, 31 says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua and which had known all the works of the Lord that He had done for Israel. They served the Lord. Joshua's wisdom did not come from an attempting to appease people. It came from an attempting to appease God. And it's very important that you understand that attempt is the right word because we all fail. We all stumble. We all make mistakes. We all attempt every day to serve God to the best of our ability. But you will never do it perfectly until you are granted that beautiful sanctification, glorification, and the process is completed when you see Jesus face to face. God commanded Joshua to choose one man from each of the tribes because God wants... This is the whole stone example that God gives Joshua. He tells them back when they crossed over the Jordan on dry ground, He tells them, get a man from each tribe, one of the twelve, each tribe, pick up a stone and take it with you. Right. They got to That's Gilgal right. and they stacked these stones up. Right. And they said, why are we doing this? And they said, well, you do this so that every time your children come and they say, what is this monument in Gilgal? Yeah. You can remind them yeah. about what God did that's for you. God. Right. And so that's what they did. They did that. That was Joshua in his final days, his final stages. The Bible says it was 110. And he knew he was getting ready to die. Right. And so he gets out and he gives us one final charge. And he says, hey, basically, I'm getting ready to die and go away from you. Right. But I want you to follow the examples, the teachings that you have heard and the miracles of God. He didn't say follow me because he said, you've seen all the miracles. You've seen God do all of this. Just follow that and teach your children likewise. And if there's one thing that we need to do better today is that we teach our children likewise of the miracles that God has done in our land, He has done in our homes, He has done in our communities, and that He has done in our lives. I begin this lesson by opening up and saying what a bad day it is in America. The fact that we have no knowledge and that young people don't know much about their history or where they've come from. I charge you today as Joshua charged the children of Israel that you erect a monument in your life and in your home that they might point to that when they get of age and they might say, Daddy, what is that? Or Mommy, what is that? And you might explain the miraculous hand of God in your life so that when you are dead and gone and gone on to your reward, they'll look back at that monument and they'll remember what their daddy said and they'll remember what their mama said. Build those monuments to the Lord. Let them have a fire inside of them that you cannot extinguish. That even you, someone they respect and someone that they love, sees your zeal for God and your boldness and magnify that in my children. I tell the Lord often when I pray, I say, Lord, I don't care how big this ministry gets or what I might do to uh, help to build Your kingdom on this earth. Lord, I want to be used and I want to be used in a mighty way, God. But let my greatest gift be these children. Let my greatest gift be these children that were raised in my home that they might go out and touch the world in twice the capacity that I could ever do that. That's my prayer for my children. God, I dedicated them to You and I give them to You. Use them. Place them in some sort of ministry. Help them build the kingdom of God. Let them remember the work. Remember the effort. Remember the trial and remember the temptation. Let's erect a monument in our own lives that others might follow behind us and that they might exemplify You. God's purpose for His people is that through You, the world might know Him. His mighty acts through us are a testimony of His glory in the world and our commitment to His cause will yield eternal results. We can't waste time and effort. We're not selling a product. We are persuading people that if they die tomorrow and no man has a guarantee, 
Are they saved? Or are they lost? Come on. Do you know Jesus? If not, can I help you find Him? Live the life and be the example for them to follow. Please stand for me. We're going to close. <clears throat> Joshua 4 and 24 says, and I think this summarizes why God did what He did, the way that He did it, why the men had to go and fight so hard. And though God could have destroyed all the enemies and just allowed them to walk freely into their promised land, why didn't God do that? Why didn't God make it that easy for them? Why didn't God just destroy? He could have. He could have. We see in Scripture where He's done those kinds of things. Joshua 4.24 says that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. It requires sacrifice. It requires obedience. It requires living for someone other than yourself and modeling that example for the world to see. Let's pray. Dear God, we love You today and we thank You, Jesus, for this privilege to be able to look at Moses and Joshua and Caleb and all of those that we've looked at today. To be able to talk about subjects, Lord, such as secession, such as passing on the, the uh, things uh, of God to the next generation. All of these things, Lord, we've looked at today. God, this is not easy, but Lord, we know that it is possible through You. And there's no greater joy than a life full of the Holy Ghost. And so God, I pray that today You might touch somebody, that something that was said might have touched some heart and some life, that they might make a commitment to You today and that they might live out every day for the rest of their life honoring that commitment. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Bless Your people, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you.